have a quick poll uh, before um, Robert's talk. Uh, are we just going to do that one now? So where do we stand in terms of regulatory authorization? Just to gauge roughly where everyone is, hopefully you are thinking about or these talks have given you more food for thought on what processes you may have to shore up. If you are just joining us, we've had several very good um, presentations, mostly focusing on FDA. Uh, but interestingly, the previous presentation did touch on EU, um, which is slightly different in terms of the in terms of approval. Uh, EU, the emergency youth authorization could be considered for different devices, uh, or you'd look at a 510k, which could take at least six months. So that's sort of the period you need to be preparing for. Uh, and the takeaway is document, document, document. It doesn't matter if it's just on Google Docs or Excel, make sure it's well organized and everything you do is justified from a safety and risk management point of view. We have plenty of resources as well in the Helpful Engineering Slack channel, uh, especially QR-RA, a uh, QA-RA, uh, where Pierre Longchamp is the um, specialist there who can help you if you have any questions about um, regulatory so is that, um, Paul, are we finished with that, Rob? Yeah, uh, I believe it's been shared to people here. I think they can okay. see it. I can see it. Uh, yeah. Hopefully they can see it. So I'm going to stop that. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, so it seems like most people are thinking or planning about planning to apply it. So hopefully these talks are really useful on sort of getting your head around what you actually need to do um, to get through the approval process. So next we have uh, Robert L. Reed, PhD, talking on the state of uh, open source ventilators and collaboration. Thank you, Ben. Uh, while I'm presenting, I can't, can't see any of the back channels or anything. So just interrupt me uh, on audio if, if you need to tell me something. Uh, I'd like to point out that um, this, is, uh, this whole conference is uh, hosted by Public Invention and Helpful Engineering, and also co-hosted by Make Magazine, who helped promote it. So thanks to all those people. This talk is gonna be a little bit different because I am just learning about regulatory compliance. I would really like to thank our previous speakers. I've tried to modify my talk quickly based on what I've learned. I've learned a great deal. Um, I'm going to talk about open ventilator composability and collaboration. This is work that has been co-done with Loria Clark and Jeff Mulligan by Public Invention. Public Invention is a USA 501c3 public charity. So I'd like to just briefly review things that we didn't know on March 15th, five months ago. Non-invasive ventilation is essential. Therapeutic oxygen is essential. Social distancing works, but in the United States, we now know only if you actually do it. Comorbidity is a problem. Mortality of invasive ventilation of COVID-19 is very high, but getting lower as doctors learn how to do things. Coronavirus affects more than lungs. People who don't die still get terribly sick. Young people die less often, but may have long-term debilitation. Previously unknown drug therapies help a lot. Some of these have implications for what we are doing as a community here. Um, Personal protective equipment is a great success story of the maker community and the humanitarian en engineering community. Um, this conference, however, is about invasive and non-invasive ventilation. And we're also gonna hear from some uh, oxygen concentrators later on in the showcase. Um, those things are harder than making cloth masks. And that's what we're engaged in. The question to ask is in 2021, will the story be in response to a worldwide shortage of ventilators, a thousand technology volunteers created a hundred independent emergency ventilator projects, four or five of which successfully saved some lives and then were shelved or abandoned. That's a very good solution. I think everyone who's 
on this call is trying to help people. Almost all of us are volunteers. Um, it would be great if we did this, or at least it would be good. It would be even better if we did this. If we created an open source composable ventilator ecosystem that saved many lives by adapting to a rapidly evolving crisis and forever changed the way that medical devices are made. And this talk is an argument that we do that in the structure of requiring regulatory compliance. As you guys um, may know, Public Invention keeps a spreadsheet of open source ventilator projects. They're probably projects we don't know about. Um, and we've analyzed these on a number of fronts. And one thing that's obvious is the world probably doesn't need 100 projects that are all trying to do exactly the same thing. If we could start this all over and we all had perfect knowledge, we probably would have modularized the problems in certain ways. So I think it's the case that we all need to be humble. There will not be just one ventilator solution. There are gonna be multiple ventilator solutions that are needed. And I think we all need to support flexibility of treatment. And I mean that medical doctors have learned and probably will learn changing ways to treat this disease. If we do not offer doctors flexibility of treatment, we're not doing as well as we can. It is not the role of engineers and, and the non-engineer volunteers who support the, those teams to tell doctors how to treat the disease. It's, their, it's our job to always be ready when a doctor needs something. Um, to be humble, we have to offer transparency of quality, which has been touched on by other speakers. The open source community, I think, is pretty good about this in the sense that by definition, if you're open, it doesn't mean you're better than a closed solution, but how good you are is transparent to everybody. People can see, you, everyone can see your code. Likewise, third party testing is valuable in some context in um, regulatory compliance, as we have heard. It's something that makes sense from an open source community point of view. We all understand it's completely reasonable to take an open source product, try to um, reproduce it and test it yourself and publish those tests. And finally, I'm going to talk a lot about conformity to standards. So to achieve the great story, rather than just the good story, we need to cancel the not invented here instinct, um, which of course we all have. We need to invest in reuse of other teams work wherever possible. Now, of course, there's a burden in learning how to use other teams work. Uh, there's a certain startup time. Nonetheless, whenever it makes sense to do so, we should try to reuse things that other people have done. As you have heard from the speakers before me, we need to invest in communication a lot. We need to invest in documenting things and communicating until we're sick of it and then do it some more. And it, as, a, as a fast and somewhat sloppy computer programmer, it is not necessarily my favorite thing to do. But it is really our moral duty in this situation to communicate as much as we possibly can. I therefore suggest we be open source from day one. Um, this next uh, concept is subject to debate, but I think we should plan to save lives this summer. I think most teams are rushing and they know the urgency of trying to save lives this summer, but we don't need to lose sight of the long game which is to provide greater capacity to the entire community um, in addition to saving lives in the short term. So uh, to me, it took me a while to learn this, but I break down a ventilator into these modules. This was work done with Jenny Filippetti, by the way. Um, you have an air drive. The air drive produces air. Maybe it's a back squeezer, maybe it's a pump, maybe it's something else. It's sensed by something. Maybe that something is a flow sensor, maybe it's a pressure sensor, maybe it's something else. Those things are tied together by a controller. The controller has a user interface. The user interface is used by a clinician. The purpose of all of this is to deliver medical gases to a non-invasively or invasively ventilated patient. Now, as we have heard, Ventilators, 
whether they are thought of as component systems, which are composed together, or monolithic systems, impacts the way you have to think about compliance. And I'm only just learning this myself. What I'd like to briefly talk on is the controller. Um, Eric, Vin, and I, and some other people have created a hopefully it will be accepted new project at Helpful Engineering that specifically focuses on the controller to provide in silico testing of the controller with a dependency injection system. In a system like this, you use fakes, and I'm using fake not in the pejorative sense, but in the computer science sense of fakes, mocks, and stubs. You create a fake patient which responds to pressure and you simulate all of the stuff. Now, this of course does not eliminate the need for integration testing, but it can improve the quality of what you're doing by testing and finding problems earlier. Now I'd like to talk about the sense module in the basic ventilator diagram because public invention has built one. And I'd like to thank Gloria Clark for doing this. So um, as, as you may know, we make the Ventmon and we give it away for free. And you can sign up to get another one. We've given away 10 right now. The Ventmon, I now know, I didn't know this, would be considered an accessory. If you look at the photo up on the right, Basically, you plug it into the airway with standard 22 millimeter connectors, and it sits between the ventilator on the inspiratory limb and the patient or the test lump, since right now the Ventmon is mostly for testing, not monitoring. And it has an airflow sensor, an oxygen sensor, and a pressure sensor. It transmits data via UDP to a public data lake. Uh, later, we'll make that um, private, but right now that's the way it works. It produces this data in a standard and public invention has published a respiratory data standards, which we call PERDs for public invention respiratory data standard. It has a binding in both JSON and byte level, which is very important for some of the work that we're doing. So I really believe as a community, creating standards, which may be never needed to exist before, can help us cooperate tremendously. So the PERD standard, I think, is pretty good. We've thought of a lot of the things that needed to, to be there. Of course, it can be versioned. Um, Dr. Uh, Schultz submitted some GitHub issues just recently to expand it a little bit, and so we'll rev the version number of the PERDs document. Every team has to represent data somehow. I believe right now everyone is representing data in their own way. And so I suggest that we use a standard. I recommend you use the PERD standard, but it doesn't really matter. Use a different standard, but we should definitely have a standard. Um, because we have a standard, uh, public invention has a system called breath plot, which allows dynamic plotting of the data, which provides the same kind of clinical things that you expect in a ventilator with the calculations over on the right. It provides dynamic pressure and flow graphs, which doctors find to be essential. And it also provides an event chart for things like errors, which may occur, alarm conditions, and even patient dyssynchrony. Um, on the event chart, we put things like FiO2 and humidity readings. And we break each breath down into uh, individual breaths, and we compute things like the rise time of that waveform and the work of breathing. This is an example of the Ventmon. It's in that little clear box on the left being used with a test lung by the RME team, uh, which is presenting in our, our showcase. Um, we have shipped 10 of these. We've made a video of how the Ventmon works. Um, currently, it is a tester, not a monitor. If you're a team and you want to use a Ventmon, we'll be happy to ship you one free of charge as long as you convince us that you're really going to use it. There's a sign-up form at the Public Invention website. So JPL made a pretty good, not open, but closed emergency ventilator called the Vital. But it has no means of displaying a pressure volume curve. So an idea would be to say, well, don't change it. Bolt on a vent mod. Now, based on Michelle's talk, I didn't know this previously, um, about parent devices, component devices, and accessories, the Ventmon might at that point be considered a accessory uh, in that it is capable of producing this clinically valuable display dynamically, uh, either as a testing calibration type situation or 
uh, later if it were to achieve compliance um, or uh, clearance with the FDA uh, as, a, as a, something that you would hook up with a real human being. Is the Bitmon good? I don't want to say it is. Uh, we developed it very quickly. Uh, it has not gone through the risk analysis and quality maintenance stuff that um, people have asked for. But my real point is that the public invention respiratory data standard would let someone else build their own Ventmon. If you don't like the Ventmon, um, build another one. As long as you conform to the standard, other people will be able to consume that data. So upcoming breath plot, there are needs which demand cooperation. This is uh, an example of why I think as a community, we should be co cooperating more than we are right now and standards allow that to be done. The keys to composability uh, and composability is slightly stronger than modularity are standards, openness, testing and investment in regulatory approval. Uh, approval may not be the right word. But we also need other standards. Um, we've started to define a control standard. It's just barely being defined. Uh, I've started writing a paper um, to uh, define um, what I call power on the airway or dynamic um, flow at pressure. Um, those are examples of nascent standards, which are not really good enough to be consumed yet. But since we're open from day one, someone could take them and improve them. So standards are probably more important than components, but components do matter. Um, we have to have plotting like breath plot. We have to have data logging. We have a separate GitHub repo with our own data logger in it, which people might want to use rather than writing their own. We need verified algorithms such as dis dyssynchrony detection. We especially need alarm stuff. I would say alarming is is one of the most important things that needs to be standardized and perhaps componentized. But we also need air drives. And I'd like, like to talk about that. The air drive is what many of the teams here have um, focused on in some ways. How do you produce air in a controlled manner? I believe we need to break that out as a component and treat it as um, uh, something that has a standard interface which we can measure and test independently of all these other issues. The issues that Michelle and Pierre and um, Rohit and other people talked about um, apply uh, a great deal to how we can utilize that idea to increase regulatory acceptance. It won't be easy, but there are pathways which they described for making that happen. So finally, I'd just like to talk about seven hypotheses um, I believe we should assume that regulators are always acting in good faith, that they're not there to increase a paperwork burden. They're there to try to make sure devices are safe. And therefore, when they ask for a great deal of paperwork, which seems burdensome to some engineers, you have to assume they're acting in good faith in um, asking for that. Testing is more important than design. Um, with composability, we may be able to make it easier to get clearance. Good standards and interfaces are the key to cooperation and therefore improving the rate at which this whole community solves the ventilator problem and saves lives. Third party testing is something that I, I think is going to be very easy. There is a paperwork paradox that in the presence of needing to do regulatory acceptance one way or another, doing more paperwork lets you go faster. May not let you go faster today, but it may be, it may shorten the time between we, us saving the first life. And therefore, we all have to just buckle down and do the paperwork which is required by regulatory compliance. Finally, I'd like to suggest that we need to um, think not only in terms of our own projects in the short term, but of constantly increasing the community capability of solving this problem. And I'd like to say in five months, we have come a long way. Um, at least in my opinion, we've come a long way. Uh, many of us know a lot more than we used to know. Many of us have built ventilators which are very close to being able to save a life. Some, some perhaps already have. Uh, but even if you discount that, 
the learning that this community has done in the last five months is tremendous. If we could dial the clock back to March 15th to with what we know now, um, we would really have saved a lot of lives, I think. Thank you. Great, thank you, Robert. That was really informative and, and hopefully, um, hopefully the message of community collaboration is, is getting through uh, to everyone because I know there's lots of amazing projects out there. Um, different strengths and weaknesses. So perhaps we can work together and, and merge some of these efforts um, to a, a useful end. As you see, it's not an easy process to get the regulatory, uh, go through the regulatory process. Um, okay, let me ask, let me answer this question, shall I? Yep. Okay. Um, what are the recommended testing methods for ventil oops, for ventilators designed by small volunteer based teams? Well, the, re the regulators, uh, the people who spoke about regulatory compliance gave you a lot of things, but technically you have to have a, a plastic test lung, not unlike this one, and you need something like a Ventmon or there are other manufacturers like Michigan Test Lung, um, uh, uh, Fluke makes flow meters which allow you to test technically in, in that thing. Uh, you test the actual output of your ventilator. There are already published spreadsheets. I've created one of them in combination with the European team that give you a list of tests to conform to, for example, the British standard. So if, as, as a base thing, you could say, we have to take the spreadsheet that conforms to the British standard, and we have to pass every test on that spreadsheet using an instrument like the Ventmon or a, a somewhat more expensive device. Okay. Uh, 70 ventilators have achieved emergency use authorization. Are they getting out there and are they reaching health care providers? Are they being deployed? I personally think not. I do not know that for sure. Um, we have on the call here, Michelle Melantine, who works with Engineers Without Borders, who is attempting to do that. I am unaware of any of those that have actually been deployed and saved lives with the possible exception of some in Northern Italy during the height of their, their crisis. You could argue that they did make makeshift solutions with solved problems at that time. Um, if someone can contradict me, please do so. I would love to know of one of these uh, homemade ventilators that has been used, uh, homemade is not the right word, and, uh, a, a pandemic ventilator, which has been used. I'm unaware of one. I can jump in if you want, Robert. Yeah, go ahead, Michelle. Yeah, so I know in terms of Engineers Without Borders, we've gotten um, kicked around questions from, from other groups as well who are looking at um, buying ventilators. I would have to look at that exact list to tell you if I, if I personally end up looking at any of those or if I know any of them are being considered. But I know that, you know, some companies, or not co companies, countries, particularly in Latin America, are really in the thick of it. Um, so Latin America, Central America, and Africa are really trying to figure out what their responses are. And there are federal dollars out there for, um, to assist countries in buying ventilators, and it's specifically allocated for ventilators. So I would have to look at that list and double check, but I actually wouldn't be surprised if a few of those devices, if they're actually at a production level, um, have been purchased and have been helping people. So, I mean, if we had to summarize maybe not quite yet, but sort of the first of them are being out there, but it's definitely not the case that a large numbers of these devices have been deployed so far. Um, there's a question, is there a list of component sources, test lungs, O2 sensors, that can be hard to source when you aren't in a hospital? Sort of. Public Invention has an open source spreadsheet for open source projects, which includes modules and components that it mostly focuses on open source ones, not the commercial ones. Uh, however, if you were to go there, you, you would find open source projects that may talk about commercial examples of those things. Okay, I think that's about the end of the question. So I'll hand it back over to you, Ben. Thanks for jumping in 
Michelle, and uh, soon we will have the showcase. Yeah, so hopefully, um, thank you, Robert. I mean, that was really good talk about open source ventilators and there is some more, I've posted some of the repos uh, for public invention and Ventmon where you can see those live plots as someone mentioned. You may have different um, engineers around the world and it can be quite difficult for them to actually access that hardware, um, which is a big challenge. Um, 